Good afternoon, Professor Jeff Zaks, and good morning, our audience. Welcome to our Innovations in Linguistics talk series. This series is organized by the International Journal Cognitive Semantics, and it invites distinguished scholars around the world to share with audience their series. Today, we are greatly honored to have Professor Zaks with us. Jeffrey Zaks holds a PhD degree from Stanford University. He is currently professor and chair of psychological and brain science at Washington University, where he studied perception, memory, and action using converging cognitive neuroscience methods across the lifespan. He has served as associate editor at Cognition, Cognitive Research, Principles and Implications, and Calabra, Chair of the Board of Scientific Affairs of APA and Chair of the Governing Board of the Psychonomic Society. Professor Zaks has written two books, co-written a third and co-edited two volumes. He has published more than 100 journal articles and has also written for Salon, Eon, and the New York Times. Today's talk is on event conceptualizations in language and cognition. Now let's warmly welcome Professor Jeff Zaks. Over to you, Professor Zaks. Thank you so much, Shan. Um, it's uh, a real honor and a treat uh, to be with you. I'm, I'm so grateful to be invited to speak with you as part of the Innovation and Linguistics series. And I really appreciate the um, the contributions of the cognitive semantics team. And I want to say special thanks to Thomas for including me in this. Um, I also want to acknowledge the organizations that have funded the research that I'm going to tell you about. Uh, the, our current funders are the Office of Naval Research, the National Institutes of Health, and um, the James S. McDonald Foundation. Um, I would like to start with a general proposal about the relationship between events in the world and conceptualizations of events. And the proposal is that cognition uses structured representations of events called event models to capture information about the spatiotemporal framework, the entities and objects involved, and other salient features of a situation. In other words, our brains are constantly building representations of individual events as we experience them, whether we are experiencing them directly or through media such as um, podcasts or movies or through written or spoken language. And I want to emphasize that in the cognitive science tradition, this is a highly representation heavy perspective. And there's a tension in the history of cognitive science between appreciating the virtues of building structured representations and being skeptical of a representationalist stance toward cognition. One reason to be skeptical is that the world is out there representing itself perfectly well in some sense. If I need to check what are the entities or objects present in a scene, I can just look around. However, I wanna propose that by carving up nature at its joints and representing the structure of the environment that is relevant for um, doing things like planning for the future, anticipating how the immediate situation is going to involve and predicting the unfolding structure of a narrative or a dialogue, building these representations can enable effective uh, predictive processing. So let me try and make that a little bit more concrete with an example. Suppose that I'm sitting watching Rebecca and Zach at breakfast. And at the moment, Rebecca is in the middle of passing a container of milk over to Zach. 
Um, a moment later, uh, Zach has accepted the milk. And then a moment after that, Zach is pouring the milk. Now, one way that I could describe that situation is in terms of physical features of the scene. For example, the velocity of the arms and uh, legs. I could describe it in terms of the positions of the objects. I could describe it in terms of the kinematics or the force dynamics of the body in motion. What are the joint angles and muscle torques? And if I were to do that, each of these transitions is characterized by a lot of change. So here I've just started listing a few of these environmental features and noting that most of them change from moment to moment. On the other hand, if my brain builds up a representation in terms of the distal structure of the scene, if I represent that uh, the action going on is giving milk, uh, this, a state here is holding milk, um, Zach is then pouring, then much less is changing from moment to moment in that representational manifold. And those changes, I want to argue, those trajectories are smoother and more learnable and more predictable. And so what this requires to go from this to this is a series of acts of conceptualization. So fundamentally, events are conceptualizations. Now, I straddle the worlds of language, perception, memory, and action control, um, leaning mostly toward the uh, memory and perception side of things. I am myself no linguist, but I want to dip here um, and dip into the linguistics literature and depend on some of the work of my colleagues to illustrate how this plays out in the domain of language. So this is an example um, uh, from Rebecca Defina um, of and looking at serial verb constructions in the Avatime language. So as this audience surely knows better than I do, serial verb constructions are syntactic constructions in which multiple verbs occur in a single clause without coordination or subordination. Um, and in this study, uh, Rebecca studied serial verb constructions in association with uh, iconic gestures. So co-speech gestures are now understood to be an integral part of speech, and some of them are like the beat gestures that I'm making now. Uh, they don't have um, a lot of direct representational content, but others are iconic gestures, and you'll see examples of iconic gestures in a minute. If I were to say um, that uh, uh, my son has gotten very tall and lift my hand like that, that would be an iconic gesture. And Rebecca's hypothesis was that if serial verb constructions are conceptualizations of a single event, then if they're accompanied by an iconic gesture, they should be accompanied by at most one of them. So to do this, she studied Avatime, which is a language uh, um, in West Africa. Um, and what I'm going to show you now is a bit of a transcript and a very short snippet of video where a speaker is telling a story. And you can gloss the what she's about to say as, after this, they beat it all, and they collect and gather it. And so collect and gather, it's represented here in the gloss with a conjunction, but it's bare verbs in the Avatime. And what you'll see, and this is right at the end of the clip, is that when she utters those uh, last words, that they're accompanied by a single gesture. So here we go. Okay. Um, and in the corpus as a whole, what we find is that if there is a gesture accompanying a serial verb construction, 100% of the time, there's one gesture that goes over the whole serial verb construction. Whereas when other complex verb um, phrases occur, they are the majority of time accompanied by a sequence of gestures. So what this suggests is that when a speaker is forming this syntactic construction, what they're doing is taking 
a um, uh, an interval of time that could be represented as a sequence of, say, two actions represented by two verbs that would be joined with something like a conjunction. And instead, they're conceiving them at a higher level, uh, forming a conceptualization of a complex uh, event with its own internal dynamics. If that's true, that you then you might expect that priming linguistically speakers of the language with serial verb constructions would affect their non-linguistic cognition about those events. And in a subsequent um, experiment, Rebecca found evidence for just that phenomenon. When you prime speakers of Abitime with serial verb constructions, this led them to group simple animated activities into larger events in a nonverbal event segmentation task. So what this suggests is that as we're conceptualizing a stream of behavior, that um, our brain has the ability to represent chunks of that behavior at multiple levels, and that there are acts of conceptualization that change how that is represented. Now that's a, um, a single event. As we experience our lives, either directly or in language, we experience sequences of events. And Rolf Swan has argued that these acts of conceptualization can be thought of as, um, as being um, a, a sequence of constructions of representations kind of akin to uh, a sequence of visual fixations taking in a scene um, visually. So he writes here that construal is the integration of functional webs in a mental simulation of a specific event. The grammatical unit on which construals operate is an into intonation unit. So the idea is that for each intonation unit, the system builds up an event representation um, and these are bounded in time location and they turn out to have a particular perspective associated with them. So there's a lot of structure within each of these conceptualizations. And as I said, he argues this is akin to the way as we are watching an activity unfold, we might fixate on the center of one action and then another and then another. So event conceptualization has structure. Another source of evidence for this kind of structure in language um, comes from uh, the way that um, comprehenders of uh, visual scenes and of language can assign thematic roles um, to the elements of the scene. So one striking thing is how thematic roles can sometimes be computed very quickly from sparse information. So um, uh, Anna Papa Fergu and her colleagues have shown that viewers confronted with a, a scene for a very brief interval of time uh, can quickly pick out the uh, agent, patient, and object of this scene and use that information. And Alon Hoffrey has really shown how from really minimal views, this is possible. That assignment of thematic roles, though it can happen so quickly that it's really impossible to introspect about and challenging to study, turns out to have internal structure of its own. So um, Alistair Knott and his colleagues have um, done experiments and developed models looking at the structure of how the working components of an event are assigned during a conceptualization. So for example, if I am watching you grab a cup, it turns out that there's a regularity to my eye movements such that I will tend to focus on you first, then focus on the cup, and then monitor the motor execution as you're reaching for that cup. Um, uh, as if I'm predicting the end state and then monitoring that it goes through to completion. And not his colleagues have argued that the same machinery is used whether we're comprehending um, somebody else's 
uh, picking up a cup or I'm picking a, up a cup myself. So the difference being that if I'm going to go grab a cup myself in that first very rapid phase, instead of focusing on somebody else, I'm focusing on me. Second, I'm still going to focus on the cup, and then I'm going to be monitoring that motor execution. Of course, I have different information about the, the, the um, evolution of that motor sequence. If I'm watching, I'm getting visual information about your execution. If I'm executing, I may be getting visual information, but I'm definitely getting um, efference feedback, motor feedback, and proprioceptive information about how it's unfolding. So what happens if I read the man grabs the cup? In that situation, uh, not would argue, we focus on the agent of the um, text, we focus on the cup, and then encode the action the end state. And so there's this tight correspondence between the construction of a structured uh, representation of the event and a construction of the syntactic structure of the description of the event. And in other words, there's a dynamical template for event representations that's shared across perception, action control, and language. So what we've seen so far is that on this relatively micro scale, we're, all of these cases we're talking about events on the scale of a couple seconds long. Um, the formation of a representation of what's happening is an act of conceptualization with its own internal structure. What I wanna do is start scaling up and thinking about conceptualizations and structure over longer time scales. That's been the focus of the work that my colleagues have been engaged in looking at the relationships between perception of dynamical visual events and perception of language and action control. So let me consider um, uh, an evolution of events on a slightly longer time scale. Um, this, the data I'm going to show you come from a study in which participants watched The Red Balloon, which is a classic children's film from uh, France in the 1960s, um, uh, I believe. And um, in this study, we were particularly interested in the psychological and neurophysiological responses to changes in, in these um, features of the scene that are abstracted, conceptualized from the low level physical features. So for example, in this brief sequence, there's an object interaction where he goes from not holding the balloon to holding the balloon. And here is a situation where the perspective shifts from outside to inside. Um, We've studied these phenomena in parallel in language as well as in visual events. So in a series of studies using this book called One Boy's Day, um, which was uh, created in the 50s, published in the 60s, um, describes a day in the life of one boy in a small town in the Midwest of the United States. Here's a sequence in, in which our subjects would read, Mrs. Birch stepped into Raymond's bedroom, pulled a light cord, hang from the center of the room and turned to the bed. So pull the light cord is a change in object interactions, just like uh, watching the boy grab a balloon was, and stepped into Raymond's bedroom is a change in the spatial perspective, just like moving the camera from outside to inside. And I'm focusing here on these two particular situational changes because we thought that conceptualizations of those aspects of the scene um, uh, would be tied to particular neural mechanisms that we knew of from independent data. So there's a lot of data indicating that processing changes in spatial location should be associated selectively with activation in the parahippocampal gyrus. So here's um, an illustration of the area that we're talking about. So this is a coronal slice as if you 
slice through the head here, and you're looking at a structural MRI image on which has been overlaid um, a depiction of areas that were more active when people looked at pictures of places than pictures of other categories. So objects that you might find around the house, faces, animals. These areas are more responsive to places than to any of those things. This is the same areas um, viewed now in an axial slice as if we're cutting through the head this way. And this is from a different study that compared navigation from a first, perspective, first person perspective in virtual reality to navigation uh, where you're just looking at a map. And so when you're embedded in the space and constructing a conceptualization of your location in the space, these areas are more activated. Now we can contrast that with areas that we would think would be important for conceptualizing, um, interacting with objects. And uh, in this nice review, um, Umberto Castillo describes a series of studies in which people looked at the neural mechanisms of actual grasping in the scanner. So this is an example of a situation where someone's lying in an MRI scanner and they're being instructed through a screen to perform various grasping movements. And when they do that, you see activity in a collection of areas. So now what we're looking at is a slice that is um, a parasagittal slice. So it's as if we're slicing through the brain this way, but off to the side, looking at my left hemisphere. And what you see is that there's selective activity in the left hemisphere in the premotor and somatosensory cortices. And so if people are using the same machinery when they're performing, observing um, these uh, um, object interactions or these changes in spatial location, when they are reading, then we would expect to see similar patterns of activation. So first, what happens when someone sees a change in spatial location? What you see is that in that study of the red balloon, there's selective activity in the parapetal gyrus. So now I'm showing you both views, the coronal view and the um, axial view. In a different set of subjects, reading the stories from one boy's day, we see strikingly similar uh, selective activation in the parapetal gyrus. So these are different people, completely different stimuli. But in both cases, we're time locking to these points at which there's a spatial change. And in both cases, you see activity in the parapetal gyrus. Um, when we time lock the object changes, what we find is that there are a number of areas that are activated. But you'll notice that some of them are bilateral. You see them in both the right hemisphere and in the left hemisphere, like these areas in the parietal cortex and the posterior temporal cortex. But in the premotor cortex and somatosensory cortex, they're strictly in the left hemisphere. And that's true whether we're watching movies or um, reading about these changes. So the neural dynamics of event conceptualizations show consistency across visual and narrative comprehension. They're systematically related to features of the stimuli. The next aspect that I'd like to turn to as we think about scaling up um, is how we proceed from one event conceptualization to another to another. Because what we've been able to avoid talking about so far is that event conceptualizations are not one-offs, that, that as we experience a stream of behavior, there's one event followed by another, by another. And one of the things that's striking about this is that um, as far as we can tell, this is coming from the mind, not from things that are strictly determined by the physical structure. So. If you look at where people identify boundaries between meaningful events, it's not that um, everything stops at, uh, as you go from one event to another. Life is continuous and the features that we're monitoring are continuous, um, but our acts of conceptualization, I would argue, chunk or discretize that continuous flux and turn it into a sequence of representations. There's a lot of evidence, it turns out, from behavior and neurophysiology 
that this segmentation of ongoing activity into meaningful events is an obligatory component of everyday comprehension. Um, I'm going to illustrate this with a little example. A task that we and others often give participants in the lab involves asking them to watch a movie or read a story and to simply push a button whenever, in their judgment, one meaningful unit of activity ends and another begins. And we can ask them to mark off either the smallest or the largest units that they find natural and meaningful. So here I'm going to show you data from 30 observers who marked the smallest units that were meaningful to them and 30 observers who marked the largest units that were meaningful to them. So on this timeline down here, you'll see a blue hash mark each time somebody identified an event boundary. And what you can see is as people, oh, can play. Oh, there we go. Um, as people are watching, when he folds that first uh, shirt, most people identify that as a fine boundary, but not a coarse grain boundary. When he folds another shirt, people are going to also identify that as a fine boundary. And they're going to start to identify coarse boundaries as well. And by the time he pulls everything off of the bed, most people have decided that a coarse event has ended. So you can notice a couple interesting patterns in those kinds of data. For one thing, there's strong agreement across observers about where the event boundaries are. With no training, people can come to a lot of agreement about the locations of the boundaries. You can also note hierarchical organization such that you've got a couple fine uh, grained events. And at the end of one of those fine grained events, it's also a coarse grained event boundary. So the fine grained events group into larger coarse units. And it also turns out to be the case that these moments that people identify subjectively as event boundaries are time locked to really interesting things going on in the brain. So here's some data exemplifying that. This is from a study by Chris Kirby um, in which part, part, participants and these um, were uh, 40 older adults uh, and 12 younger adults as a comparison group. They watched movies uh, like the one that I just showed you while we recorded brain activity. And what I'm showing you here is areas of the brain that showed transient increases at event boundaries compared to the rest of the movie. Um, this is the left lateral surface, right hemisphere, and then this is the left medial surface and the right medial surface. And you can see there's a wide and consistent um, swath of cortex that shows these kinds of effects. These plots over here are illustrating the temporal dynamics. So what you find is that the activity usually starts rising a little bit before the point that they identify the event boundary and peaks a little bit afterwards. And in most um, parts of the brain, for most kinds of stimuli, uh, the responses are larger for coarse-grained events than for fine-grained events. And you see similar results for commercial cinema edited movies, and for story reading. So this is showing you that there are transient overall increases in the brain using a really um, inventive analytic method. Chris Baldassano and his colleagues showed that there are lots of areas of the brain whose patterns, local patterns of activity are shifting at those times that we're also seeing these transient overall activity increases. So it's not just that the amount of activity is changing, it's that you've got a stable pattern in some of these areas that then shifts to another pattern. So here, visualized in the same way, we've got the left and right hemispheres, lateral and medial surfaces. Um, uh, Baldassano and colleagues have plotted areas that show pattern shifts at points that people would identify as event boundaries. And the color scheme is illustrating the time scale on which they're shifting. So these areas in, say, early, early visual cortex and in object-sensitive areas of the visual parts of the brain, they're changing their pattern quite frequently. 
Whereas these areas where we saw the largest responses to event boundaries here in the lateral and medial parietal lobes, they're shifting much more slowly on the, on the order of 20, 30 seconds. Um, oh, I should mention just because it's so cool, the study, the stimulus that they used in this was the BBC series, Sherlock. This is illustrating um, this hierarchical organization. As you move up from early visual areas to late visual areas, um, to these areas in the parietal lobe, um, on the lateral surface and medial surface, what you find is fewer and fewer event boundaries. But you see this hierarchical organization where when you have an event boundary at a longer time scale, you usually also have one at a shorter time scale. So as you move in general forward through the brain, but it's, it's also moving out in different directions, you're getting into longer time scales. And these um, uh, higher time scale, longer time scale regions, their boundaries line up with a set of annotations that humans provided to indicate the major conceptual breaks in the, in the clip. So I want to emphasize that in both of these studies, the participants when they were watching the movies, were not asked anything about segmentation. They've never heard of the idea of event segmentation. So that's pretty strong evidence that whatever's going on in their brains is not just related to a set of a particular task that we're asking them to do. And so what we see is that both transient responses, overall magnitude and pattern shifts align with deliberate segmentation. And that both of these things happen on multiple time scales, and uh, those time scales are hierarchically aligned. And these results suggest that the brain is building a sequence of event conceptualizations on multiple time scales during comprehension. In the lab, we've been investigating one particular mechanism, uh, computational mechanism by which the brain might construct these conceptualizations. And the proposal is that as you are um, navigating your environment, you're constantly, uh, your brain is constantly making predictions about what's gonna happen next. And I said at the beginning of the talk, um, one reason to build these more heavyweight representations of events is to improve your ability to predict. So the idea is that as you're doing this predicting, having a stable model of what's happening now is gonna improve those predictions but you got to know when to update them. And so one possibility for how the brain works out when to update is by monitoring the quality of its predictions and updating when there's a spike in prediction error. And so the idea is that when you encounter a spike in prediction error, um, there's a broadcast signal that gates inf new information into those uh, event models. And at that point in those points in time, they're updated with new sensory and perceptual information, and also maybe with information pulled from your long-term knowledge in the form of schemas and for your episodic memory for things that have happened in the recent past. So the idea is that as you're going through reading about or observing or participating in an uh, activity, um, you go through these phases of mostly low prediction error punctuated by spikes in prediction error. And at those points, you shift from one state to another. <laughs> So um, this view entails that when things are changing in your environment, you're more likely to experience event boundaries because changes are generally less predictable than stasis. So if things are staying the same, it's easy to make predictions. But when things change, you're more likely to experience a prediction error. So in these studies of the red balloon that I described, um, I already told you about how we coded for changes in spatial location and object interactions. We also changed, coded for changes in causes, characters, interactions amongst characters and goals. And we wanted to test the hypothesis that when more of these features were changing, people would be more likely to identify an event boundary. And that's exactly what you find. So for both fine grain segmentation and coarse grain segmentation, the more event features are changing, the more likely you are to experience an event boundary. This is true for the movies, and it's also true for the one boy's day narratives. So here's a um, 
little bit longer excerpt from the beginning of that story. It says that Mrs. Birch went through the front door and into the kitchen. Mr. Birch came in and after a friendly greeting, chatted with her for a minute or two. Mrs. Birch needed to awaken Raymond. Mrs. Birch stepped into Raymond's bedroom, pulled the light cord hanging from the center of the room and turned to the bed. Mrs. Birch said with pleasant casualness, Raymond, wake up. So we can code this for changes in uh, similar dimensions, cause, character, goal, object, space, and time in this case, and just code each clause where there's a change in one of those, in each of those features. We presented these stories in three modalities. So they were read by a trained actor. We presented them visually as a sequence of individual clauses. And we also presented them visually as a continuous text on a page. For these first two, we asked people to push a button while they were um, listening or reading. And for the third one, we asked them um, to mark with a pencil on the page where they, where they saw event boundaries. And for all three of these modalities, you see the same pattern as we saw for the movies. For both fine grain segmentation and coarse grain segmentation, the more stuff is changing, the more, the more likely people are to segment. So that's consistent with the idea that um, the segmentation of activity into ongoing event conceptualizations is related to prediction error. But a more direct test might involve actually measuring prediction error directly. And in a couple uh, series of experiments, we've undertaken that. One method we use involved an explicit prediction task. So in these experiments, people watch movies for which we knew where subjects were likely to identify event boundaries. And um, from time to time in the movie, we would stop the movie and ask viewers to predict what was going to happen in five seconds by choosing one of two pictures. So the movie stops, and then we ask them which of these two pictures so shows what's going to happen in five seconds. And we can select points such that five seconds later is either part of the same event, that is to say, few people identified an event boundary in that interval, or it's the start of a new event, that is to say, lots of people identified an event boundary in that interval. So you pause the clip, present the test, and then we restart the clip so people get feedback on whether they made the right prediction or not. And what we found is that prediction errors are more likely when you're predicting across an event boundary uh, than when you're predicting within an event. And when we asked people to do this while recording brain activity with functional MRI, we found that uh, areas associated with signaling prediction error um, in the dopaminergic midbrain and its targets in the striatum, a series of subcortical structures, uh, those areas increased more when they were trying to predict across an event boundary. Um, another method we use, I'm particularly attracted to because it allows us to assay prediction error without stopping people and interrupting the perceptual processes we're interested in. So what I'm going to show you here is a slowed down clip uh, from a movie in which a woman's making breakfast. And this pink dot is going to track the eyes of one of our viewers as they watch the movie. And what you're going to see is that the eyes do a lot of predictive looking. They look ahead to objects that her hand is going to contact in a little while. So those yellow boxes are showing uh, an object that she's going to reach to in three seconds. And what you saw is that for the bowl and the frying pan, the eyes get there well before the hand does. And so that's an example of the eyes being guided by the brain's predictions. And we hypothesize, um, this is the work of Michelle Eisenberg, that, uh, that this predictive looking would break down a little bit at event boundaries. And that's what you see here. So here we're, we're plotting the time course of predictive looking. So this is the moment at which the hand contacts each of these objects, and we're measuring looks into those yellow boxes that we drew around the objects in the three seconds leading up to that. And what you see is that well before the hand arrives there, um, uh, people are looking a substantial fraction of 
each of those intervals at that object. But they get there a little more quickly when that object is being contacted in the middle of an event compared to an object uh, that's being contacted at an event boundary. Right at the moment of contact, they're looking at it more if it's a, an object being encoded at an event boundary. But they're able to look a little bit more predictively when it's in the middle of an event. So another thing that this view entails is that these conceptualizations are short-term or working memory representations, and also that they have um, consequences for the formation of long-term memory representations. So I want to transition first to thinking about short-term memory. Can a swallow in a series of experiments found evidence that people are more likely to update the contents of their working event memories at event boundaries than in the middle of events. And to do this, um, she showed people picture, uh, sorry, clips from the cinema of the world. This is from a Jacques Tati movie from the 1960s about Paris after World War II. And what you're gonna see is after this little interaction with a girl and an older woman, uh, this man who is Jacques de Tati, the director, is gonna turn and walk through this door here and all, oh, oh, that's terrible. It, it jumped ahead so you didn't see him actually walking through the door. But when he turns and walks through the door, all of our participants uh, tend to say, that that was for them an event boundary. And that we hypothesize would make it harder for them to identify which objects had been presented just before that event boundary. So we presented people with a series of trials like this where they're given two objects and asked to choose which of them occurred. And uh, I invite you to, to guess which of these objects you just saw on the screen. It turns out that the correct answer is the chair. And then we restart the movie so they can see that the chair is right in the middle of the screen. It was on screen for about 10 seconds. And the design of the experiment um, is again, like with the prediction experiment, drawn from our knowledge of where other viewers had identified event boundaries. So we knew from norms that there were event boundaries at some places in the movie. And we selected sequences such that in some cases, you have an object that is on the screen during an event boundary. And then we test it within the same event that it was still um, uh, encoded in. And we have possibly that this kind of object ought to be remembered really well because there ought to be less updating from here to here compared to situations where you cross an event boundary before you test. And also, we hypothesized that if the object was on screen during one of these um, updates, that that would help solidify its encoding in long-term memory. We also have objects that were not encoded during an event boundary, but we still test during the same event. Those we thought would be remembered well. These objects are encoded during an event boundary, but another event boundary occurs before they're tested. We hypothesize that these might still be remembered well because they were encoded in effectively into long-term memory. So even if there was an update of short-term or working memory, they might still be available in long-term memory. Whereas these objects that were not encoded during an event boundary and were tested after another event boundary had gone by ought to be in really bad shape. There were hypothesizing an interaction between when the object is encoded and whether an event boundary occurs between encoding and test. In every case, the interval between when the object goes off screen and when it's tested is exactly five seconds. So that's control. And what you find is, as predicted, as long as you test within the same event, the portion of correct on the memory test is quite high. If there's an event boundary before the test, but the object was encoded during a previous boundary, performance is still quite good. Whereas 
if there was an event boundary before test, but it was it encoded in the middle of an event, performance is no better than guessing. So identification of an object seen five seconds ago is worse if an event boundary occurred after the object disappears. If the object was encoded during an event boundary, this is protected. This suggests that event models are updated at event boundaries, leading to both short-term and long-term consequences. The next bit of data I want to turn to focuses on these long-term consequences. And so this is the work of David Stowarczyk, Chris Walheim, and Michelle Eisenberg. And in these studies, what we've done is show people situations in which you can use your episodic memory to drive predictions about what's going to happen next. So in these studies, um, people see a movie, it's usually 30 to 40 minutes depicting the day in the life, a day in the life of our actor. So this is from about two thirds of the way through the movie. She's getting home from work. She walks up to the door, um, opens the door and goes inside. After watching this movie, we show them another movie and we tell them that some of the things that she engages in are going to be similar to activities that she performed on the previous day. So again, on this day two movie, about two thirds of the way through, she gets out of the car and walks up to the house and goes inside. And if you were using your episodic memory, your memory of what happened the first time to make predictions, once you see her out of, get out of the car, your brain might start to predict, anticipate that she's going to unlock the door. However, you may have noticed that in this particular sequence, we inserted a change. On, whereas on the first day, she opened the deadbolt above, on the second day, she opened the door handle. Um, and so we hypothesize that if the brain is guiding the eyes to look at objects that she's going to be reaching for, if you are using your episodic memory to drive those predictions, the eyes might go here and then have to course correct when her hand actually goes here on the second day. So does that happen? Well, first let me show you that like in the previous study using eye movements, we find lots of evidence for predictive looking. So what we're, you're seeing here is time divided up into um, 20 bins going from the first 10 go from the start of the activity to the point at which the two versions that we filmed diverge from each other. And then going from that divergence point to the point at which her hand contacts the object, in this case, either the um, deadbolt or the door handle. And while they're watching the day two movie, uh, sorry, the day one movie, that first movie, what you see is they're engaging in a fair amount of predictive looking. The eyes are getting there well be before the hands. And we can break these down into repeated and changed activities. Of course, on day one, repeated and changed are the, still the same. So we wouldn't expect to see any differences, and we don't. On day two, what we find is that quite early in the event, people are looking ahead to that object that she's going to reach for, the, in this case, the door handle. And they keep looking at it with some probability all the way to when her hand contacts it. On the other hand, if on the previous day she had reached for the deadbolt and now she's reaching for the door handle, they're not looking anymore at the, um, at the, at the door handle than they were at baseline. So they're later getting to that door handle. They still get there before the hand does, but they're playing a lot of catch up. Where are they looking during this period? Well, we can hypothesize that they, if their brain is driving predictions based on their memory, they'd be looking at the object that she had reached for last time. And in fact, that's what you see. Compared to day two, there are elevated rates of looking at the object that she had looked at the previous time. That's a prediction error in visual looking. And the theory says that those prediction errors, though they're a disfluency in the short term, they're interfering with your comprehension in the short term, if they're triggering an updating of your event conceptualizations, 
then that ought to be helpful for forming effective long-term memories. So we hypothesize that when people have better long-term memory, they'd be more likely to have made this prediction error. So what we did is measured predictive, measured looking, back sorted based on whether people subsequently remembered which object uh, she looked for and that there was a change. And so what you're seeing here is the data sorted based on whether they recollected that the activity had changed or not. And what you can see is that those predictive looking errors are more likely to occur on the trials in which people um, uh, were subsequently able to remember that things had changed. So in this experiment, another one, we found that memory for a similar recent event produced errors in predictive looking when things change. And these errors were associated with better encoding of those changed endings. We also um, looked at this paradigm using neuroimaging and the neuroimaging evidence suggested that these prediction errors resulted from memory retrieval during day two viewing. So we saw event specific patterns of activity in um, these areas, same areas that you saw in the Baldassano study, we saw selective reinstatement in those areas associated with better memory for the changes. So the proposal is that when you find yourself in a similar situation, you see the actor getting out of the car, that cues memory retrieval, which drives predictions. And this is adapted. The reason our brain is building these representations and using our episodic memory to construct them is because it most of the time leads to better predictions. But when things change, these predictions lead to errors, which is a disfluency in the short term, but can lead to working memory updating and long-term memory updating. Okay, so I've started mostly with language, uh, focusing on the very small scale dynamics of event conceptualization. I've broadened out in time and I've strayed farther and farther from language, I need to admit. Um, but now I wanna kind of try to return and put it all together. So my view is that language and cognition both depend on shared structured event representations. Building these representations is a series of acts of conceptualization. One mechanism that may regulate these acts of conceptualization is gating based on prediction error. And some of the evidence I showed you for that is that the subjective experience of event segmentation is associated with change. Segmentation is associated with prediction error. Event model updating leaves deep footprints on immediate and long-term memory. Um, we can see this in immediate short-term and working memory effects and in long-term memory effects. And finally, the event model prediction and updating help us to reuse situations and cope with changes. Um, I want to leave you just by returning to one last example from language. And this is from the novel uh, The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. This is four sentences from the book. And one could quibble a bit about what's the best way to count the number of event descriptions in this passage, but I'd like to suggest that it's about 16 or so. so sat at the head of the party, 13 dwarves all around, sat uh, on a stool by the fireside, et cetera. If you color them in like this, you can see that event descriptions make up a lot of the discourse in this passage. And it's, this is not exceptional. This is just a mundane piece of novelistic writing. And I'd suggest that this is the case because a lot of what our brains are doing when we're comprehending language, producing language, or simply acting in the world is constructing a series of representations of the events that might unfold around us. And so I'll leave it there. I'm looking forward um, to discussion. And I just want to conclude by acknowledging um, that as you saw as I was speaking, this work depends on uh, a lot of really stimulating, engaging, long running collaborations um, by the people who I uh, highlighted during the talk and by this uh, larger lab group here in St. Louis and our collaborators um, around the world. So thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to discussion. Okay, thank you, Jeff, for this wonderful and well-structured 
presentation. Uh, well, next we come to the discussion. Um, may I first invite our editor in chief of cognitive semantics, Thomas uh, Fuindi, to start this discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Dex. Uh, it uh, contains a lot of content. It's uh, uh, very uh, significant. So uh, you, you mentioned about the theory of verb construction. Uh, I would like to know uh, what is the maximum amount of verbs a, a, a theory of verb construction language can, can contain. Uh, did you ever, uh, you know, read a language? You would know way better than me. So the what I am told by my colleagues who work in this area is that the early accounts of serial verb constructions attested that to you know constructions that had that could get really really big, and that there's now some controversy about whether that's really possible or whether those are actually not serial verb constructions. But like to say any more than I know that there's some question about how big they get would be like to go beyond my depth. I think the audience is probably mostly better informed on this than I am. Okay, then uh, in your talk just now, you, you indicate it seems like uh, in a theory of verb construction, there's no, uh, there is a one gesture. Does that mean the, the theory, uh, theory of verb construction contains only um, one event, or uh, you may not call that event, maybe a, a macro event or what, what, what kind of a name you got. Do you indicate that the serial verb construction sentence contains only one, one big event? Yeah, so, so I think that, you know, Jürgen Bonemeyer's concept of macro events um, uh, is, is a good one to apply here. And, uh, and I, I, I want to thank you for asking this question. So I've argued that um, a given interval of time can be conceptualized on a hierarchy of time scales. So for intervals at least out to tens of minutes, I think that the brain is con is constructing representations that span intervals that long. But for anything that's longer than a few seconds, you have the option, the, the brain is constructing multiple levels of representation. So you could be focalizing a very low level where there'd be more events within there. Or if you're making a serial verb, the argument would be that what you're doing is that's a con reflecting or focalizing a conceptualization. And at that, such that at that level, there's only one event or macro event. Okay. And then you study, um... In the uh, psychology, and we study uh, language linguistics. Of course, you also study language. And I have a a, a question concerned with the uh, uh, diachronic process. You know, in linguistics, we study uh, you know the uh, constructionalization and uh, grammaticalization are very popular in Asian and Chinese. We have you know two clauses: clause one, clause two, and then with the uh, with the comma separate. All together, but during the process, the two clauses joining together, and then the verb one contained in the clause one, and the verb two contained in the verb uh, in the clause two, joining together to to become uh, initially to become a serial verb, uh, now V one and V two, uh -huh. but gradually, and gradually in the current days, uh, the second verb is grammaticalized, and uh, uh, to mean not the original meaning of the Asian, but you know, to mean the uh, the tenses and the the, uh, the the temporal uh contrary and sort of thing like that. Okay, now my question concerns. So the original clause one, clause two, the representation of mind, the neural uh, event model or structured event representation. Is that different from the modern people's representation of the of the joined together uh, event? Is that, is that clear? Yeah, that's totally clear. So I think there's a couple of questions, issues there. So 
the first is that you know because of this hierarchical organization, both the ancient Chinese speakers and the modern Chinese speakers presumably had multiple event conceptualizations active at the time. Um, and so when we want to ask, is the we really want to ask, is the collection of conceptualizations that's active different? And then we can also ask above and beyond like which what is the collection of act of conceptualizations that's active, which is is focal. So one thing that a language change could one possibility, right? If you are um, a strictly um, uh, cognitive universalist, anti-Warpian, if you have that view, then one possibility is that language has no effect on what's um, uh, what's conceptualized and what's focalized. Another possibility uh, is that the language structures may change what level you're attending to. Mm -hmm. And then another possibility is that language structures may modify the hierarchy of conceptualizations that's created. And I, you know, I don't know what the data say um in support of i think the first of those possibilities is unlikely um and, but with respect to the second versus the third i just don't know whether there's strong evidence that it changes the population of conceptualizations so for the uh, for linguistics we can study the grammaticalization we have the ancient data and the but for, for you, psychologist, and how to study the uh, the new law representation for yeah. the Asian people, is there any possibility? Well, so the main way that, um, uh, you know, the main way that people uh, have been approaching these questions in the literatures that I look at are either by doing cross-linguistic comparisons or language priming manipulation. So, um, you know, if you're interested in hypothesized organizational effects that are going to be um, present even in the absence of forming or comprehending language, then what you'd want to do is compare speakers of different languages and try to suppress active linguistic cognition as much as possible. If you are interested in thinking for speaking kinds of effects for effects in the moment as a function of the language that you're processing, uh, then uh, a really effective way to do that because you can experimentally manipulate is with language priming, you know, prime people with different kinds of constructions and look at um, linguistic dependent variables. So the, uh, in that way, the, the, the linguistic, the language data is also very important. Oh, totally. Yeah, okay. Okay, before I give the opportunity to the audience, I um, I think I will ask a very important question. <laughs> I, I think it is important myself. Uh, so in, in the uh, grammaticalization, they study the grammaticalization of a specific term, specific word, but from the uh, uh, your event point of view, can we study the, you know, evolution of an event to take event as a whole. And we study how event event interaction and to study the evolution of language from, from the perspective of event and event relation. Is that possible or is there any current research in this um, aspect? You, you're talking in terms of language change. Um... In terms of event. Yeah, I mean, I think totally it should be possible. I and I'll I'll bet, you know, if you gave me examples, I'd say, oh yeah, of course, that's an example of doing that. But I can't bring one to mind right now. Um, yeah. I can't bring one to mind right now. Okay, that's um, okay. 
Uh, I think the uh, we have audience waiting for <laughs> the opportunity. Hi, Doshan. Okay. Uh, now for our audience, if you have any questions would like to discuss with Jeff, you may unmute yourself uh, or you can leave your questions in the chat. I think Selena Liu um, is prepared for the first question. Yes, thank you, Shang. And uh, thank you, Professor Vax, for this very brilliant talk, as well as for your research, because I noticed that there are many updates in your research compared to the 10 lectures you gave in 2017. So my first two questions relates to some clarifications. Um, in reading you and uh, Thomas Shipley's 2008 book, Understanding Events, I noticed that um, Professor Shipley, actually he compared the two terms, objects and events. Um, he stated that there are commonalities and the differences between the two terms, uh, especially he built a relationship of analogy. So in your today's lecture, you mentioned both um, objects and the entities. I'm not quite sure how do you define entities and how to, do you differentiate between objects and entities? Thank you. Um, by entity in this context, I just meant um, uh, something that can be a, uh, an agent. Um, so uh, that can, you know, undertake actions on its own. Uh, basically, we're talking about, you know, people and animals. Um, and, and by objects, you could include um, uh, people and animals as objects, but it's, it's more convenient usually to treat them as exclusive categories. So we're going to divide things up into things that are animate and the things that are inanimate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it seems it's, uh, it is related to the semantic roles, right? If we use it in, in um, if we map it into the language, linguistic side. Yes. And in terms of language, it's related to this, to the, um, the roles in the event structure. And in terms of like um, the uh, taxonomic categories, you know, it's, it's related to, to the categories that have the features of uh, self-caused movement. Mm -hmm. um, um, another point that interests me most is you talk about the serial verb construction. Actually, um, when we look into serial verb constructions, we know there are multiple events involved, but I noticed you didn't use the term like compound event. This is also a term that uh, Professor Shipley talked in his introductory chapter. And when I uh, read about compound event and also uh, your serial verb construction introduction in um, authentic language, I equate this term to tell me a macro event term. I'm not mm -hmm. sure uh, if this is right because he defined macro event as event complex. So um, I will, I'm wondering if there is any specific reason that you did not use compound events in your lecture uh, when you talk about, um, for, for example, there is a sequence of events, but not a, a event compound. Right. No, I was not attempting <laughs> to make a distinction. So, so my feeling is that if you consider like an interval of time at a given location, the brain can, can if it's an interval of any decent length, the brain can conceptualize that as a, a sequence of smaller things or as one larger thing, or maybe there's you know a few levels in there. And it does, and it does, does both of those things at the same time. Um, and so if we're referring to that larger uh, thing, it's a compound and though it has parts and the parts have structured relations to each other. And we can also conceptualize the parts themselves. And the parts may have subparts. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you for your clarification. Um, my last question is a follow-up question. Um, in your lecture, I learned that events uh, are first conceptualizations, and second, uh, events conceptualization has structure. So um, it also seems that this structure is hierarchical, right? Uh, in people's um, conception, event conception. Um, but if we want to map it onto the uh, linguistics uh, level, I was wondering how do you think uh, this um, hierarchical structure would be like? Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So I think the the very lowest levels of the hierarchy, we have these um, these structures that can um that can relate like two adjacent levels or maybe even three at a time um mm -hmm. but at higher levels we uh, sorry can relate them using the the kinds of tools that we talk about using linguistics right the um the lexical and uh grammatical um and and intonational uh features of language. At higher levels, I think the relevant features of language are things that the things that people study in the discourse processing literature. Um, uh, so the kinds of, of structures that we're talking about are, um, are structures of like um, argument overlap and coherence and cohesion and um, causal relations and goal relations. And we often don't think of them as so much features of language as features of discourse or features of cognition about events. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. That's very helpful. So over to you, Shan. Okay, thank you, um, Professor Zachs uh, and Selena for your uh, talk. I think there is around a couple of questions. Uh, may we first invite uh, Xin Khan. Um, okay. Hi, Professor Zach, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. And, and actually I'm also working on language processing and uh, event representations, but among special populations like those with artisan spectrum disorder. And I also use the visual word paradigm, but mostly with pictures. So uh -huh. I really liked um, the way uh, that you use movies as uh, stimuli, especially uh, you know the ones that you recorded. So my first question is about the stimuli. Um, would you please share us a little bit more, like how you prepare those stimuli and what kind of controls you have taken into account when you make those uh, stimuli? Thank sure. you. Yeah, over the years, we've made um, many, many different stimulus sets. Um, and, uh, so some of them, uh, we ask people to perform activities, give them very light scripting, like the, you saw the clip of the woman, um, making breakfast or the man, uh, folding his laundry. Um, those are examples of those. And, um, the example for the event change studies of the where the woman was walking out of the car into the house there it's much more highly produced um so we write a very detailed script with these alternate versions and we film from multiple camera angles and we do relatively heavy editing and then in some of the studies we take pre-existing footage and edit it um one uh one recent stimulus that I would love to have time to talk about, I, I'll, I'd like to put into the chat so I can uh, bring it to your attention. Let me um, let me just grab this URL and I'll paste it in. But while I'm grabbing the URL, um, I'll describe what this stimulus set is. It's called the Metacorpus. Um, and uh, here we go. And um, meta 
stands for. Sorry, let me just get back to the. There we go. Okay. So meta stands for uh, multi angle extended three dimensional activity stimulus set. And this is 25 hours of activity recordings. Um, each of them was recorded with three um, video cameras and a time of flight infrared depth sensor which allows us to track the position of the body in space over time. And from that, we can recover a whole bunch of features describing how the body is moving in space. Um, and then we also used a combination of computer vision and hand coding to track the positions of objects. Um, and so we can describe what objects are present in the scene and where they are relative to the actor's hands. Um, and, uh, and the objects are represented not just as bald labels. So the labels are embedded in a vector semantic space from the GLOVE machine learning model. So GLOVE is a model that, that uses a neural network to learn from a big corpus such that it can represent um, the semantic similarity uh, amongst the objects. And then all of the 25 hours was uh, segmented into coarse-grained and fine-grained events by uh, 30 uh, observers. So there's a lot there, and we're really excited for um, people to be able to use it. And if you go to that link that I posted there, um, everything is up there. And then there's also a paper describing uh, the corpus, and I'll give you a link to that too. Um, grab that URL. So this is a paper that's currently under review and it describes what's there in the corpus. Yeah, thank you so much. It sounds a lot of work, uh, but I think one thing that I was thinking about because my participants they were, they're from the Chinese cultures. So when I, well I look at those movies briefly, I think you know uh, people from got Caucasian face. So I, so I I think there might be some culture effects there. So I might as well need to record our own movies. But it really sounds a lot of work. So I. I was wondering, so if the actor and actress were were they graduate students, or did you actually hire someone? Were you working together with movie producers? Yeah. It sounds yeah. like definitely not something easy to do. Yeah, so I, we've never used um, trained actors, um, except for one small stimulus set where we had um, a researcher in the lab who was also a filmmaker and used. And he wrote very tight scripts and used um, his colleagues as actors. Um, with respect to cultural differences, there's very interesting work by Kenna Swallow and Chi Wong um, comparing um, uh, segmentation of uh, American viewers and Indian viewers looking at movies of activities that are typical in the US, but, but selected to be less typical in India and vice versa. Um, and um, to their surprise, if I'm remembering the data right, um, the, there are differences between the groups and their habitual grain of segmentation that are consistent with the kinds of differences that you would expect from, um, uh, from previous research on, uh, on uh, independent versus um, interdependent cultures. But there weren't the kinds of big expertise effects that you might intuit. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Would you please uh, spell the one of the author's names so maybe yeah. I'll be able to find the paper. Yeah, Thank Kenna, K-H-E-N-A, -E 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 swallow, S-W-A-L-O-W, 
Okay, I got it. So from the Department of um, Psychology. Okay, I found it. Thank you so much. So actually, uh, my second question is, uh, so I was wondering if you have any current work that is going on about any of this work on special populations. Like, cause um, yeah. one of the reason I work um, on autism spectrum disorders, individual with that is cause there's a hypothesis uh, published in 2014 on PNES. So Sin and uh, her colleagues, so they, they propose that autism is a disorder of prediction. So, but so, so far they, there are a lot of evidences um, from, you know, um, from perception and from other uh, type of domains, but not really from the language domains. So I think one of the reasons is um, we use mostly the paradigm that we use only involve one sentence with only a single picture. But uh, so that's why one of the reasons I would like to work on this area. So, but I don't know if anyone who are currently also working on this area and also what's yeah. your uh, intuition about what do you yeah. think like so special yeah, prediction. Yeah, so there has been a little bit of work on event comprehension in autism. Um, in my lab, the the special populations that we've worked with. First of all, we take a lifespan development perspective. So we look at kids as young as four and older adults um, all the way through the eighties. Um, and then we also study um, older adults with early stage Alzheimer's disease or biomarkers for Alzheimer's. We've uh, uh, done a series of studies on people with uh, post-traumatic stress. Um, we've looked at people with um, focal brain lesions due to combat injuries. Um, those are the main special populations that we've looked at, but there really is a growing literature on event cognition okay. in across development and in special populations. Okay, so so did you find they have issues with updating or prediction? So yeah, so for example, um, in PTSD, a reasonable hypothesis is that the the um, prediction error signals that one could use, that the brain could use to update event representations um, might be disruptive. And this is what we you know, usually characterize as um, hypervigilance. And uh, there's a long, long, well-established literature that comprehension and memory for events related to one's trauma is disrupted in PTSD. But it also turns out that there are not so dramatic, but pervasive effects on cognition in just everyday domains. And, and where hypervigilance comes in is if, if you're constantly experiencing, um, if the registering prediction errors where there isn't a prediction error, then you one would, you'd expect that that would disrupt one's segmentation. And if one's not identifying adaptive um, event units that that could cascade forward into forming less effective memory representations. And we see evidence for that. We find that um, people with more PTSD symptomatology don't segment as well, they don't remember as much, and those things are related to each other. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Xintan. Um, there is another question in our chat uh, from Xue Li. And she asked, what are the implications of this kind of research? So I think there are tons of implications. I think they're very broad. I, are there particular areas of implication that you were thinking of? Yeah. Too general. <laughs> OK, uh, I Thank asked you. this question. Uh, uh, so event conceptualization in language and co uh, cognition has always been my favorite uh, research area. Uh, but in recent years, I transferred to uh, critical uh, discourse analysis, but I'm still interested in this topic. Um, so um, now in China, when we apply for like a national social science funding, uh, some scholars don't like this kind of very, very, uh, they say, very, very uh, language related to specific topic. 
they want our research to uh, serve the country or contribute something to the country. So this is a kind of utilitarian um, purpose. So uh, I want to ask like uh, how this kind of research maybe can contribute to AI uh, designing maybe? Sure, okay, great. Okay, um, thank you. So <laughs> the first thing I would say is I just think it's important for us as communities to push back against overly narrow short-term thinking about what counts as important research. Um, asking the hard questions is a high risk, high reward approach to pushing our societies and our economies forward. You, you can't always predict where the important discoveries are going to come from. And so you have to, in addition to doing product development and applied research, you also have to ask the hard questions for which we don't know the immediate application. Having said that, I'll say that I think that um, event cognition is an area that's rich with, um, with practical applications. And we, we're seeing a lot of that research at this point. Um, the two areas that I've been most interested in are in technology design and human technology interaction and in um, clinical neuroscience and neurology and neuropsychology. So on the technology side, um, uh, uh, researchers interested in dealing with large video corpora or um, uh, gaming or automatic video editing or event recognition for the purposes of um, uh, driving uh, interfaces or software based on uh, actions uh, are finding that the, the models uh, of, and mechanisms that we've discovered that humans are using in order to segment activity in time and to uh, conceptualize to categorize and recognize events are valuable for uh, building those systems. Um, in the and and one thing that's been really gratifying for me as someone who's a child of the cognitive science revolution is that we again have this really productive two-way street between people who are interested in engineering and artificial intelligence and people who are interested in psychological and biological mechanisms. On the clinical side, um, uh, we've found that um, event cognition and event memory measures are very helpful for categorizing cognitive development, cognitive decline, and cognitive impairment. And uh, so just one example from our lab. Um, a thing that we very often do in clinical uh, neuropsychology is bringing people into the lab and ask them to remember lists of words or pictures. Um, and we try to make those as simple and unstructured as possible in the hope of getting a pure assay of their memory abilities distinct from their knowledge and motivation. And that makes sound sense, The prop, but there's some problems. One problem is that memory impaired people hate these tasks. They find them really aversive and threatening. Um, and another problem is, and they also find them really boring. Everybody finds, you know, memorizing word lists to be a, a boring activity. Whereas if you bring up a patient into the clinic and you say, I'd like you to watch some movies, and then I'm going to ask you some questions about them. Most people find that not threatening at all. And we find that measures where we just ask people to watch movies and tell us what they remember, predict things like biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's staging, um, uh, structural integrity of the hippocampus, as well as these lab-based clinical measures that are um, difficult to administer and more aversive to our participants. We're also testing in the lab interventions that have been driven by this theory that we find can improve memory for everyday events. So one thing I, one joke I often make is that um, for like 3,000 years, we have had interventions that you can use if you need to remember arbitrary lists of words, right? So the, the method of loci goes back to um, 
either the at least the Roman Empire, probably the, the, its Greek predecessors. Um, and I'm sure that like um, in the, in the history of cognition in China, there's mnemonic techniques that go back just as far as if if not farther that allow you to improve your deliberate encoding of things like lists of words, which is great if you have to remember a shopping list and don't have a smartphone, but we have smartphones. And on the other hand, if someone comes into my lab and says to me, you know, Professor Zox, um, my, my son's gonna graduate from high school next week. And I really want to remember every all the details of that. What can I do to improve my memory? Or if uh, someone comes in and says, you know, I'm worried that that um, I'm developing a memory disorder as I get older, and I'd like to improve my ability to encode the conversations I'm having with my loved ones. What can I do? We've historically had nothing for it. So we found in the lab that if we improve segmentation, and we've got a couple of techniques to do it, that that improves memory. And so a whole line of research in the lab is aimed at figuring out what are the neurobiological and cognitive mechanisms that lead that intervention to work? Are they still effective in healthy older adults? Are they effective in people with, uh, with dementia? Um, and, and what is it that makes them tick? So that's another kind of application. Wow, thank you so much for giving uh, me or giving us this example. So I think this is a clinical implication. Sure, I, I wanna be very careful. I don't wanna oversell where we're at with these interventions, right? So first of all, the effect sizes are not super big. So this is not something that's gonna like take someone who's amnesic and fix their memory. And second of all, we're not doing large scale clinical trials yet. I hope someday to get there. But you know, there, there's a lot of steps before you can really convince this, yourself. That yeah, I understand. So maybe not directly, but indirectly, and maybe finally, it will contribute to yeah, at least this particular area. Hopefully, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, Yama. Hi, Yama. Uh, I'm introduced. Um, Hi. Hi, can you hear my voice? Yes. Yeah, hi, Jeff. I, 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 I'm happy to introduce another assistant working in another room, restreaming your talk to the, uh, using the Chinese Zoom, we call the Tencent. Yep. So could you report to Professor Zex what is happening in another room? Uh, okay, hi Jeff. My name is Yuan Meng, and I'm uh, and I'm chairing the other channel uh, of today's lecture. And during uh, and during your lecture, we have more than eighty uh, Chinese audience to join this lecture with the audience in the Zoom uh, meeting. So congr congratulations! <laughs> That's exciting. Uh, uh, yes, and I have. Uh, moved the question uh, and I have transferred the question here in the chat you can you can see you, you may see yeah. it uh, yes yeah. this question is from a uh, Tencent meeting audience yeah so uh, yeah go ahead uh, can you see that it's in the chat oh yep. uh, yep. yes uh, do you want to answer this yeah so I answer with some trepidation because um I, again, this is one of these ones where a lot of the audience is going to be better informed than I am. But um, I think, you know, what's so exciting uh, about the linguistics and psycholinguistics of events and discourse is that the, you know, the order in which words are serialized in language production is this dance between the order in which things happen and the, the conceptual structure that the brain builds as things are happening. So it's certainly not the case that, um, uh, that everything about word order depends on the order in which things happen, but it's also certainly the case that, um, uh, that there are lots of correspondences. 
I think the importance of time skills, uh, I think, is, is great here. So you when know, we talk about things at the level of discourse structure, um, on the one hand, there is a lot of, if you're talking about something as it's happening, on longer time scales, there's going to have to be a strong dependence between the serial order in which things happen and the order in which you talk about them. On the other hand, if you're talking about things from memory, there's this ter terrific lability to jump around, right, and to tell a story out of order. And the cognitive and affective consequences of uh, varying the relationship between the order of um, describing events in the order in which they happen when you're talking about retrospective events is really interesting. And then on short time scales, there's lots of parallel, you know, things that are experienced in parallel that have to be serialized in order to describe them in language. So like, you know, if you take something like in English, um, uh, Bill kicked, just two words, right? Um, it's not that Bill came first and then kicked came after. Uh, the reason it's Bill kicked rather than kicked Bill is a matter of the grammar of the language. Um, so there's this dance between the things that are given by the structure of the language, things that are given by the structure of one's event conceptualizations that are shared across language perception and action, and the order in which things unfold. And uh, and the you know, that, those issues are on the very small scale, the kind of fodder of the, of theories like Ali Knotts that I was describing at the beginning of the talk. So the uh, structured event representation, is, is that your latest model? Um, so the, the current computational model that we're working with is called structured event memory. Um, and let me, I can pop in a reference for that. I can actually, there's two. So one is a paper from Psychological Review. Nick Franklin is the first author. Um, uh, and I'll get you that one in a second. But um, the reference I'm going to pop in here. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so this is a paper um, that adapts the structure event memory model to model the meta corpus that I described. Um, and this is new, very new work that I'm really excited about. Um, it's, I was tempted to like give over half of my talk to talking about this work, but it's less relevant to the language issues than the things that I chose to leave in. So it was a difficult choice, but I, I hope that this will tempt you to take a look at that um, paper because I'm, I'm really excited about the, paper, the corpus and the model and the paper. Um, now, let me see if I can find um, the structured event memory. Yeah, here we go. Um, so this is, <coughs> the paper that describes the core structure of the model and applies it to a bunch of um, uh, classic problems in event cognition and memory. Uh, then may I understand in this way, your, your previous uh, prediction error model is mainly for linguistic representation and your current structured event representation is for the neural. No, no. So the the old model, so these are, they're both computational models that are intended to apply to both language and perception. Um, and they're both intended to have, um, to generate predictions for both the neurophysiology and the behavior. Both models to this point have really been tested mostly on behavior. We just collected a large neuroimaging data set that we're going to use to really beat on the, on the new model. And I'm very excited about that. In, in Nick's paper, um, the, the psych review paper, he models a bunch of language data sets 
as well as movie kinds of data sets. In fact, there's probably more language uh, data sets in that model than, than visual event data sets. Um, but uh, in most of them, the language structure is not super salient. There is one cool piece of the modeling in that paper that's about how to effectively represent um, roles in role fillers uh, in a continuous representation. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, Zosha. Okay, thank you um, hey, for a wonderful talk. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> um, um, may I ask a question? Um, so, um, dear, dear Jeff, thank you for this impressive uh, lecture. My question is that um, uh, it's about the focus uh, order of event participant, which may influence the information structure of event uh, in linguistic representation. So, as you have said that, um, the focus order ranked like um, the agent is before the object. So is this um, related to the animacy of the um, participant? Uh, like in the movie, The Red Balloon. So the little boy will uh, gain the first information, uh, the first attention um, comparing to the uh, red balloon. And like in the same situation, um, a transfer uh, the book um, to B. Um, so A is the agent and the book is an inanimate object. And uh, the B is also an animate um, part event participant. So how will people distribute their attention um, in the event cons uh, construct or in linguistic representation? Um, like a gives the book to B, and A give B the book, given that the book is the um, is the given or the known information or the accessible information. Yeah, I mean the, the animacy and the accessibility of the information. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So that's a great question. So starting with animacy. Um, as you surely know, there are these uh, these data um, about attention and eye gaze as a function of animacy. So if you have people um, looking at pictures or making judgments about pictures, um, where they look and what they attend to is driven can be driven both by what is made the, um, the subject of the sentence and also by what's animate. So in English, uh, you can have a picture in which, and so this is the work of Kay Bach and Senzi Griffin and their colleagues. Um, you can have a picture in which, uh, um, say, a, um, uh, a man is hitting a ball. So I could describe it that way, the man hit the ball. Um, or I could say the ball is hit by the man. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, so that I make the patient, the inanimate patient, the subject of the sentence. Um, but I could also have a picture in which uh, the inanimate ball is hitting the man rather than vice versa. And so I could say the ball hit the man, or I could say the man was hit by the ball. So uh, you can have inanimate uh, agents, inanimate, animate or inanimate agents, animate or inanimate patients. Yeah. You can have the animate thing being the subject, the animate thing being the object, and all of these things matter. Um, and then as, uh, I'm less familiar with the effects of like what is new information versus what's already in the common ground, but I know that those things matter too. That there's a um, there's a bias to attend to the new information. One important wrinkle on that, and um, this is in part the work of Ali Knott and his colleagues, is that the way that these dynamics of attention play out 
appears to critically um, change when we're looking at dynamic events rather than static pictures. So when you're examining a static picture, which is an ecologically strange situation, right? So normally if like there's a, you know, if there's a ball hitting a man, um, that's unfolding in real time and you kind of got to be doing stuff in a very time-locked fast way, that, which is different than staring at a, a, a still picture of a ball hitting a man. And when, when things are moving in dynamic, um, a lot of these patterns can be altered by that. Ah, so um, we will um, predict it according to the um, whether it is a dynamic object or not. So do you think that, that um, the, a dynamic object will um, um, gain the attention uh, first uh, comparing to the, um, um, the static um, uh, animate um, participant? Um, oh, that's a great question. So suppose that you had a situation where you've got like a person sitting still being hit by a moving boulder. Uh, I, I think that both factors would matter and I don't know that you'd expect to be able to draw a, a so maybe picture. this is a probabilistic question right yeah i mean and i'll bet there's other factors that also are going to matter in that situation yeah okay thank you thank you so much for this wonderful answer and uh, please give my best to uh leslie and delia thank you so oh, much well, it's so nice and so excited to see you again it's great to see you too okay thank you mommy uh and for your uh, talk uh well um jeff i actually have uh, a small question and you uh you mentioned that the uh you listed actually the cause character character interaction object interaction mm -hmm. goal and space um uh at the at this uh, for the predictors uh i mean that uh when they are changed uh, then we can say that there is a, an event segmentation. So, yeah, so here's what I would say. You can code events for lots of things. The features that we used in those studies, you know, characters, objects, space, time, time is a weird one, um, uh, goals, causes, those, um, we selected mostly because they've been investigated uh, by um, Rolf Swan and his colleagues in the context of the event indexing model and by others interested in that model. Um, and there, but, you know, they weren't selected by those folks by accident. They were selected because they thought that those were important dimensions of situations across lots of different kinds of situations. But you could code in other studies, we've coded things like body position, speed, distance, acceleration. Um, and uh, you can code things like changes in object contact. You can code things like distances between body parts and object. It turns out that whatever set of features that you can think of to code, chances are that the, the changes in those features are going to be, first of all, associated with segmentation, and second of all, correlated with changes in lots of other features. So when we see that changes in, say, goals are related to event boundaries, that doesn't mean that, like, changes in object movement are not related to event boundaries because those things are correlated with each other. And working out which one is really causally responsible is really tricky. So part of what we've been trying to do in this work with the Metacorpus um, and the modeling of it using the SEM model is come up with a mechanistic model that um, can use all of that correlational information, the, the correlations across features, in the attempts to drive the strongest possible predictions about what's going to happen next. And we're interested in whether the ultimate reason all of these changes are associated with event segmentation is because they really are associated, associated with breaks in predictability. 
and prediction error. Um, and there are some really interesting alternative possibilities that we're also investigating. Okay, thank you. And another question concerns um, how do you like the event segmentation and event integration? Um, I mean, uh, are they, if we, uh, for example, if uh, when we segment an event and then uh, if we come together, come uh, combine all the, the uh, character uh, together and then uh, can people um, uh, perceive uh, it as a unitary or will become a unitary event? Um, say more about you, what you mean by perceive altogether. Mm, they will um, uh, regard it as a, a single event. Um, or, or in your um, study, maybe the uh, colors green, I mean, and the final green. Sorry, the, the oh, course green, right? Yeah, okay. So I think I understand what you're getting. So partly it's a matter of like, um, what's the part that you want to consider to be the foreground versus the background? So in lots of areas of cognitive psychology, people have suggested that segmentation and unitization are two sides of the same coin. So right, you could think about if you've got some extent, and in this case, we're mostly talking about extents in time, the same thing holds for extents in space, and you've got boundaries and regions within that extent, you could say, well, we're taking this larger thing, we're dividing it up, or you could say we're taking all these little individual moments and we're chunking them together and unitizing them. And I think that those are basically descriptions of the same thing. I think that for me, the key thing about event conceptualizations is when we're chunking all those little bits together, it's not an undifferentiated mass that's being grouped into a region. It's a structured entity, right? These event conceptualizations are highly structured themselves. Okay, thank you for your clarification and explanation. Um, I think uh, that is really a fruitful uh, talk and discussion. Uh, so if there should be no uh, questions, um, we may call it today. And, and thank you for, uh, again, for accepting our invitation. And thank you all, our audience, for joining us. Thank you again so much for inviting me. I very much enjoyed uh, this work for me as evening for you all morning. Thank you, Jeff. It's really a good talk. Okay. Take care, thank everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Hosisia